part two of comparing fractions. In the first video on comparing fractions, we covered all the basic fraction ideas. Everyone taking the GRE should know those basic ideas. This video covers some very advanced ideas. And so some people are gonna watch this video and say, wow, that's really cool, that makes so much sense. Other people are gonna look at this and it's gonna make no sense to them whatsoever. So if you're highly skilled in math, these can be time savers only on the hardest math problems that you'll see on the GRE. And again, you would have to be an advanced math student even to see the hardest problems on that second math section because the test is section adaptive. If you're struggling with math, you'll never see those harder problems. So this can be fun for math lovers, but if you're not, not a math lover, if you're getting frustrated by this video, you don't even need to watch it. You don't need to know this at all. And so it's, it's something really only for the more advanced students. And so, of course, everyone is welcome to watch it. Get as much out of it as you can, but don't worry if it's over your head. So first of all, let's just review the basic patterns, the stuff that everyone should know. Make the numerators bigger numerators, you get bigger fractions. Make the denominators bigger, you get smaller fractions. Multiply the numerator and denominator by the same factor, you get equal fractions. And then, of course, you can compare numbers with cross multiplication. So those are the basic ideas. What if we add the same number to both the numerator and the denominator? So this is where the new stuff starts. What if we add the same number to the numerator and the denominator? Here I'm gonna show an advanced technique, a visual technique that allows for quick approximations. If we add the same number to both the numerator and the denominator, then the resultant fraction is closer to one than was the original fraction. And so if the original fraction were somewhere down here, less than one, it would move up closer to one. But if the original fraction were somewhere up here, larger than one, it would move down closer to one. So it's as if one is the great attractor and everything is moving toward one when we do this trick of adding the same thing to the numerator and the denominator. For example, start with three fifths. 3 fifths is obviously less than 1. So suppose we add the same thing to the numerator and denominator. Let's, for example, let's just add 6 to the numerator and denominator. We get 9 elevenths. Well, that resultant should be closer to 1. Since we started out less than 1, the resultant should be larger than it, closer to 1. So in fact, what's happened is the fraction has moved up closer to 1 as a result of adding 6 to the numerator and the denominator. So 9 elevenths is bigger than 3 fifths. Now start with something bigger than 1. Start with 7 fourths. And let's just say we add 1 to the numerator and denominator, 8 fifths. All right. So now we're going to move toward 1 again, but because it's bigger than 1, it's going to move down to move toward 1. So moving from 7 fourths to 8 fifths, we actually move to the left, we move down. So 8 fifths is less than 7 fourths. Often the real trick here is to recognize that this pattern is applicable in the first place. Once we see the pattern is in play, applying this rule is very easy and involves essentially no calculations. So pause the video, work on this, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, well, first of all, we notice, because we've, we've been kind of set up by the discussion we've had, but we notice that this trick is in play. And essentially, what we've done is we've added 3 to the numerator and denominator. And because we're adding 3 to the numerator and denominator, we're going to move closer to 1. Well, this fraction, this initial fraction, 147 over 200, is less than 1. So if it's less than 1, moving closer to 1 makes it bigger. So... 150 over 203 is going to be slightly bigger than 147 over 200. And so the answer here is answer choice B. What if we add something different to the numerator and denominator? How does the value of the fraction change? Suppose, for example, we add 2 to the numerator and 5 to the denominator. Well, now the great attractor is not going to be 1 anymore. The great attractor is going to be 2 fifths. 
and the resultant fraction will be closer to two fifths on the number line than was the original fraction. So anything that starts out lower than two fifths is going to get pulled up closer to two fifths, but anything that is larger than two fifths is going to get pulled down closer to two fifths. Again, two fifths now is the great attractor if we're adding two to the numerator and five to the denominator. So start with one eighth. One eighth is less than two fifths. We add two to the numerator and five to the denominator, we get three thirteenths. Because we started out less than two fifths, moving toward two fifths makes it bigger. And so this fraction has gotten bigger. Three thirteenths is greater than one eighth. Now start with three quarters. Well, three quarters is bigger than a half, and a half is bigger than two fifths. So this is definitely bigger than three fifths. Now we're going to add 2 to the numerator, 5 to the denominator, we're going to get 5 ninths. Well, now we're going to move closer to 2 fifths, but because we're starting out larger than 2 fifths, moving closer to it will make it smaller. And so we actually move down, we move to the left from 3 fourths to 5 ninths. So 5 ninths is smaller than 3 fourths. In general, here's where we can abstract and generalize this now, adding p to the numerator and q to the denominator slides the fraction in the direction of p over q on the number line. If the original fraction is smaller than p over q, then the result is bigger. If the original fraction is larger than p over q, then the result is smaller. And so it's all about p over q becomes this great attractor. You start out lower than it, you get bigger. You start out higher than it, you get smaller. If we subtract numbers from the numerator and denominator, we just get the opposite effect. If we add to the numerator and subtract from the denominator or vice numerator, then whichever fraction has a larger numerator and a smaller denominator is bigger. It just has to be bigger. Here's a practice question. Try to do this without a calculator. Okay. Well, notice a few things. We added 6 to the numerator and 9 to the denominator, so the resultant fraction will be closer to 2 thirds. Well, where were we starting? The starting fraction, 37 over 60, 37 over 60 is less than 40 over 60. 40 over 60 equals 2 thirds. So we started out lower than 2 thirds. We moved in the direction of 2 thirds. And so that meant that we actually had to get slightly bigger. And so it became slightly bigger, and so the answer is B. Here's another practice question along the same lines. Okay. Well, here we just added, the, this is just the first trick, we just added the same thing to the numerator and denominator. That means we get closer to 1. Well, 171 over 100 is bigger than 1, and so it must get smaller when we add 9 to the numerator and the denominator because it moves toward 1, and so it means that 171 is act over 100 is actually the bigger fraction. Answer choice A. Here's a good word problem. Pause the video and then we'll talk about this. Okay, in this problem, we could set up all kinds of complicated ratios and use the calculator. We could make this a very hard problem, but it turns out it's a relatively easy problem. The old ratio, the original ratio, is six teachers over six teachers to 200 students, or in other words, three to 100. And I'm gonna reduce that to approximately one over 33.3. And then we're adding, 1 to the numerator and 35 to the denominator, which is going to move everything closer to 1 35th. Well, 1 35th is smaller than 1 over 33.3, bigger denominator, smaller fraction. So adding 1 to the numerator and 35 to the denominator will decrease the ratio. And so it means that the, the old ratio is bigger than the new ratio, and the answer is A. 
we start with a fraction and add the same number to both the numerator and the denominator, that resultant fraction is closer to 1. If we start with a fraction and add p to the numerator and q to the denominator, the resultant fraction is closer to p over q. And again, this is a very visual trick. It's a very hard trick to, to see and to apply. If it's something you understand, it will save you time. Don't worry. If, if this is something over your head, you will never need to, to know this. In this video, we're simply going to talk about how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide fractions. First of all, addition and subtraction. We can only perform addition or subtraction on two fractions when they have a common denominator. With a common denominator, we can just add or subtract across the numerators. For example, 1 fifth plus 3 fifths, we just add to get 4 fifths. 9 thirteenths minus 6 thirteenths, 9 minus 6 is 3, that would be 3 thirteenths. Obviously, the test will demand more complicated math than this. Most often, when we have to add or subtract fractions, the fractions given do not happen to have the same denominator. We're given something like this, for example, 1 third plus 1 seventh. In this case, we need to find a common denominator. That is, we need to find equivalent fractions of each fraction such that these equivalent fractions have the same denominator. To get equivalent fractions with the same denominator, I will multiply the first fraction by 7 over 7 and the second fraction by 3 over 3. So I start out with this, multiply the first by 7 over 7, the second by 3 over 3. Of course, in each case, I'm multiplying by 1, so I don't really change the value. I get these fraction. 7 over 21 is another way of writing 1 third. And 3 over 21 is another way of writing 1 seventh. But writing them this way, now they have the same denominator. Now we can just add 7 plus 3 is 10. We get 10 21sts, and that's the sum. Another example, 3 fifths minus 1 third. Multiply the first one by 3 over 3, the second one by 5 over 5. We get 9 fifteenths minus 5 fifteenths. 9 minus 5 is 4. That's 4 fifteenths. For small numbers, we can simply multiply the numerator and denominator of each fraction by the denominator of the other fraction. So for example, if we're adding a over b plus c over d, we can just multiply the first fraction by d over d, the second one by b over b. The problem with using this as a default strategy, this runs into big numbers very quickly. So for example, if I'm adding this, if I multiply the first one by 24 over 24 and the second one by 12 over 12, I'm going to get enormous numbers, much bigger than 100. And that's going to be, it's going to be quite, kind of cumbersome to do math with those numbers. Well, notice 24 is actually a multiple of 12. So all I really have to do is multiply the first fraction by 2 over 2. If I multiply by 2 over 2, then immediately I get a common denominator of 24. I can add and simplify. Another example, 1 14th minus 1 21st. Well, if I multiply the first one by 21 over 21, the second one by 14 over 14, I'm going to get a number way over 100. As a general rule, if you're doing simple calculations and you wind up with a number way over 100, you're probably doing things the hard way. Here, I could just notice, well, both of these are factors of the number 42. So if I multiplied the first one by 3 over 3 and the second one by 2 over 2, I would get a common denominator of 42. And then it's easy, 3 minus 2, 1 42nd. In that last example, I quote unquote noticed that 14 and 21 had a common multiple in 42. And this may be discouraging. You might think, oh gee, well I have to notice these things. What if I don't notice them? Well, it turns out, there's a general procedure for finding the least common multiple of two numbers. This is also known as the least common denominator. This is discussed in the inter integer property module. So once you get to the integer property module, you'll be able to do this procedure and find the least common denominator of any two numbers. Here are some practice problems. I recommend pausing the video and trying these on your own. These are the solutions. 
Now, multiplication of fractions. Of the four operations, multiplication is the easiest. It is by far the easiest. We just multiply across in the numerator and the denominator. Piece of cake. Two sevenths times two thirds. That's just two times two in the numerator, seven times three in the denominator, four twenty-firsts. Very easy. What's a little trickier about multiplication of fractions is what you can cancel. So if we're multiplying 5 over 14 times 7 over 15, we can actually cancel the common factor of 5 between the 5 in the numerator of one fraction and the 15 in the denominator of the other. They go down to 1 and 3 respectively. We can also cancel the 7 in the numerator with the 14 in the denominator of the other one. They go down to a 1 and a 2, and we just wind up with 1 half times 1 third, which is 1 6. Much, much simpler. When multiplying two or more fractions, you can cancel any numerator with any denominator. If there's a common factor between any numerator and any denominator, you can cancel it. And I'll say right now, always cancel before you multiply. This is a huge mathematical strategy that people overlook. If you always cancel before you multiply, you will make your life so much easier. Here are some multiplications for practice. You might pause the video here and practice these right now. Here are the results. Some folks are confused by multiplication between a fraction and a whole number. It can be important to remember here that we can write that whole number as a fraction by putting it over 1. And then it makes it very clear how the fraction multiplication works. Finally, division of fractions. To divide by a fraction, we multiply by its reciprocal. So if we have one quarter and we divide by three halves, this is one quarter times the reciprocal, two thirds, and of course we can cancel and we get one sixth. If we take the fraction three twentieths and divide by six fifths, of course, we can multiply by the reciprocal, 320 is times 5, 6. We can do a little canceling, and once it's simplified, then we can get an answer. To divide a whole number by a fraction, multiply the whole number by the reciprocal of the fraction. So 6 divided by 3 quarters is the same as 6 over 4 thirds. Again, we're going to write that 6 as 6 over 1, and then just do the fraction multiplication. To divide a whole number, to divide a fraction by a whole number, multiply the fraction by the reciprocal of the whole number, which will be in the form 1 over n. So if I have 3 fifths divided by 2, this would be 3 fifths times the reciprocal of 2, which is 1 half, and of course this is 3 tenths. Here are some practice division problems. Pause the video and practice these on your own. Here are the solutions. In this video, we talked about adding and subtracting fractions and the skill of finding a common denominator. We talked about multiplying fractions and cancellation. We, ha we had the proviso, cancel before you multiply, one of the most valuable math strategies you can use in preparing for the test. And we talked about division with fractions, including number divided by fraction and fraction divided by a number. In this video, we're going to talk about four mathematical properties for fractions. The first topic is just more on the topic of canceling and order of operations. Big idea number one, multiplication and division are at the same level of priority in GEMDAS and can be done in any order. GEMDAS is the acronym I use for order of operations. If this is unfamiliar to you, you can watch the order of operations video. But the big idea here is that multiplication and division are at the same level of priority and can be done in any order. Big idea number two is that canceling itself is a form of division. It is division of the same factor in the numerator and the denominator. Big idea number three is always cancel before you multiply. Always make the numbers smaller before you make them bigger. For example, if we have a times b over c times d, we could write this as 
A over C times B over D, or we could write this as A over D times B over C. In other words, we could reorganize it as long as what's in the numerator stays in the numerator and what's in the denominator stays in the denominator. The order doesn't matter. Remember, when multiplying fractions, you can always cancel a factor in any part of the numerator with a factor in any part of the denominator. If it helps you to see what to cancel, you certainly can split the fractions into several fractions, but you don't have to. So for example, suppose we had to perform this. This would be a horrible thing if we just multiplied out the numerator separately, multiplied out the denominator. This would be incredibly ugly. Instead, we're going to do some canceling. Now we could write these as separate fractions, but we don't have to do that. We can just leave them as is and cancel in place. As long as we're remembering, we can cancel any part of the numerator with any part of the denominator. So, I'm going to cancel a factor of 8 between the 56 and the 64. They're going to go down to 7 and 8. Then I'm going to cancel a factor of 9 between the 54 and the 45. They're going to go down to 6 and 5. Then I'm going to cancel a factor of 12 between the 72 and the 60. They're going to go down to 6 and 5. Then this is tricky. The 8 has several factors of 2 in it, so I'm going to cancel a factor of 2 in each one of the 6's. That means each 6 goes down to 3, and I've canceled two factors of 2, so the 8 goes, gets divided by 4 and goes down to 2. Well, now I can just multiply across, and I get 63 over 50. And that is the simplified version of this product. These same ideas can be used to cancel factors in algebraic fractions. For example, in this algebraic fraction, I'll start out by canceling a factor of 3 between the 27 and the 6. So that goes down to 9 and 2. Then I'm going to factor a 2 out from the parentheses. So instead of writing 2y minus 2, that's going to be 2 times y minus 1 which gives me the same factor in the numerator and denominator. Those can cancel directly, and I'm just left with 9 times y plus 5. There'll be more on this in the algebra module. Here I'm just showing the fraction principles that would apply. The second idea we'll talk about is addition or subtraction in the numerator or the denominator. We can separate a fraction into two fractions by addition or subtraction in the numerator. So if we have a plus b over c, we could write that as a over c plus b over c. If we have d minus e over f, we can write this as d over f minus e over f. We cannot separate a fraction into, into, we can, into two fractions by addition or subtraction in the denominator. So for example, here, people want to do the separation, separate it out by the addition or subtraction in the denominator, and those are illegal moves. This is a very tempting mistake to make. It's very important to recognize this and realize this is something you can't do. If we have addition or subtraction in both the numerator and the denominator, we can split up the numerator, but the denominator has to stay unchanged. So for example, a plus b over c plus d, we cannot write it like this we have to write it like this. The denominator stays unchanged. Most of the applications of this will also be in the algebra module. One application with pure numbers is changing from an improper fraction to a mixed numeral. For example, suppose I start with the improper fraction 17 over 3. Well, I'm going to write that as a sum, that 17 as the sum of the largest multiple of 3 less than 17 plus something else. So the largest multiple of 3 less than 17 is 15. So I'm going to write the 17 as 15 plus 2. Separate this into two fractions. The 15 over 3 becomes just ordinary 5. And then 5 plus 2 thirds, conventionally this is written as 5 and 2 thirds, the mixed numeral. The third idea we'll talk about is multiplying a fraction by its denominator. And the big idea is fraction times its denominator equals the numerator. So for example, 4 sevenths times 7 just gives us 4. This can be very useful in solving equations. So for example, if I have to solve for x, all I have to do is multiply both sides by 5 and it will cancel on the left side. And of course, I'll get x equals 15. 
simplifying complex fractions. What's a complex fraction? A complex fraction is a big fraction that has smaller fractions either in the numerator or the denominator or both. A complex fraction purely of numbers can just be turned into ordinary fraction division. Complex fractions become a bit trickier when a bit of algebra is involved. So for example, suppose we have this ugly complex fraction. The strategy will be to multiply the numerator and the denominator of the big fraction by each denominator of the inner fractions. So I'm going to start with that 15. I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by 15. In the denominator, it will just cancel and I'll get the numerator, which is x plus 6, the numerator of that little fraction. So I've eliminated the fraction in the denominator at this point. I will distribute the 15 in the numerator. So I get 15x, then I get 1 6 times 15, and that simplifies to 5 halves. Well, now I still have a fraction in the numerator. The fraction in the numerator has a denominator of 2, so I'm going to multiply the entire fraction by 2 over 2. And when I multiply through, I get this reduced version. So this is a simplified version equal to the original, but no longer a complex fraction. Now this is just a simple fraction with a single numerator and a single denominator. We discussed patterns of cancellation available in fraction multiplication in this video and talked about its relationship to the order of operations. We can split fractions by addition or subtraction in the numerator, but not in the denominator. That becomes important in algebra. We talked about the shortcut of multiplying a fraction by its denominator, and we talked about how to simplify complex fractions. Mixed numerals and improper fractions. In the intro to fractions lesson earlier, we briefly discussed the issue of improper fractions versus mixed numerals. Both of these are options we have for writing a fraction that is larger than one. You may remember that an improper fraction is a fraction whose numerator is larger than its denominator. So for example, 17 over three or 40 over 11. A mixed numeral expresses this exact same information as an integer written next to a fraction that is less than 1. So for example, 5 and 2 thirds is the mixed numeral equivalent of 17 over 3. And 3 and 7 elevenths is the mixed numeral equivalent of 40 over 11. The test may give you numbers in either form and may list the answer choice in either form. First of all, it's very important to be comfortable changing from one to the other. So change these improper fractions to mixed numeral form. Pause the video and just take a moment to do it yourself and then we'll talk about it. Okay, that first one, 28 over 5. Well, the biggest multiple of 5 that is less than 28 is 25, so I'm just going to express the 28 as 25 plus 3. Split up the fraction like that. The 25 over 5 becomes 5 and then it's 5 and 3 fifths. For 60 over 7, the biggest multiple of 7 that is less than 60 is 56. So I'm going to write that as 56 plus 4. 56 over 7 is 8, and so that's 8 and 4 sevenths. The biggest multiple of 13 that is less than 80 is 78. So I'm going to write this as 78 plus 2, and 78 is, th is 6 times 13. So 78 over 13 is going to be 6. It's going to be 6 and 2 thirds altogether. Change these mixed numerals to improper fractions. Again, pause the video, work on these on your own, and then we'll talk about these. Okay, the way we do this is thinking about it in terms of fraction addition, because technically between that integer and that fraction in each mixed numeral is an implicit addition sign. And so we find a common denominator. 12, we'll multiply that by 2 over 2, and so that becomes 24 over 2 plus 1 over 2, that's 25 over 2. We'll multiply the 8 by 6 over 6, so it becomes 48 over 6 plus 1 over 6 equals 49 over 6. We'll multiply the 3 by 19 over 19. 3 times 19 is 57. 
So 57 over 19 plus 3 over 19 gives 60 over 19. Those are the improper fraction forms of those mixed numerals. So changing from mixed numerals to improper fractions or vice versa is one big idea. That's an important skill. Even more important than that is understanding the relative usefulness of each form. In other words, when would we want to have one form versus the other? It's great that we can have either form, but what is strategic? When would we want to use one form versus the other form? So mixed numerals are very useful if we need to locate the fraction on the number line. This could be helpful in comparing the fraction in size to another number. That's the principal use of mixed numerals. For adding and subtracting, it really doesn't matter that much. The two forms are about equal in difficulty. But here's the big idea. In multiplying, dividing, and raising numbers to a power, mixed numerals are worse than useless. And improper fractions are definitely the way to go. What do I mean by that? Worse than useless. Think of it this way. What is the value of 1 and 5 sevenths squared? Now you see, if you think about that in terms of mixed numerals, first of all, very few people on earth could square a mixed numeral in their head correctly. And most people, if they tried to do it, they would do something like square the one and square the five sevenths and add those together, something like that. In other words, almost anything that they would try would be wrong. And so it just, it's an invitation to make thousands of mistakes because it's almost impossible to do it correctly. Well, by contrast, suppose we just change that mixed numeral to an improper fraction. 12 sevenths. What's the value of 12 sevenths squared? Well, that we all can do in our heads. That's 12 squared over 7 squared, or 144 over 49. This is much, much easier to do in one's head. And so improper fractions are much better for cases involving multiplication or division or raising to a power. This has profound implications for problems with mixed numerals. If the question gives mixed numerals in the prompt, asks for a calculation of some kind, and gives all mixed numeral answers, do not assume that you do the calculation in mixed numeral form, because mixed numerals un under many circumstances are worse than useless. Instead, you should change the prompt numbers to improper fractions do the calculations with the improper fractions, then convert back to mixed numerals. Here's a practice problem. Pause the video and then we'll talk about this. Okay, so this is multiplication. We're given the prompt numbers in mixed numerals. We're given answers in mixed numerals, but do not assume that you're going to do the calculation in mixed numeral form. Most people who try to do this calculation would make all kinds of mistakes. It's not very easy to multiply mixed numerals. So instead, what we're going to do, we're going to change those to improper fractions. It seems like this might be a, a lot of extra work. It actually it enormously simplifies the problem. So 1 and 1 6, that's 7 6. 1 and 11 21st is 32 over 21. Well, now we're going to multiply those fractions, but of course, before we multiply, we're going to cancel. Notice we can cancel a factor of 7 in the 7 and the 21. Then we can fact cancel a factor of 2 in the 6 and the 32. Well, now that we've, we've canceled any, everything, we're down to the lowest terms that we can get. So we'll, now we'll just multiply, and we get 6 over 9. Well, now that we have our answer in improper fraction form, we'll change this back to a mixed numeral. 1 and 7 ninths. That's the actual product, 1 and 7 ninths. So go back to the answer choices, and we select the correct answer choice, answer choice A. Here's another practice problem, dividing mixed numerals. Pause the video, and then we'll go through this together. Okay. Same deal. They give you mixed numerals. The answers are in mixed numerals. The naive test taker is going to think, uh-oh, I have to divide the mixed numerals. 
Anyone who tries to divide mixed numerals is going to do it incorrectly. It is almost impossible to divide mixed numerals correctly. So we're not even going to talk about that. It's a very hard conceptual thing. Instead, what we're going to talk about is let's change those two mixed numerals to improper fractions. So rewrite them as improper fractions. I get to 45 over 8 divided by 9 over 2. Of course, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. 45 over 8 times 2 over 9. Cancel the factors of 9. Cancel the factors of 2. And I just get ordinary 5 fourths. And of course, now that we have that answer, I'll just rewrite that as a mixed numeral, 1 and 1 quarter. So it turns out the quotient is 1 and 1 quarter. Answer choice A. Finally, another problem of this ilk. Pause the video and then we'll talk about this. Again, the same sort of thing. What we're seeing here is we have 1 and 4 fifths, a mixed numeral squared. Well, no one can square a mixed numeral. But what we're going to do is change this to an improper fraction. An improper fraction, 9 fifths squared, well, that's just 9 squared over 5 squared, or 81 over 25. Well, now that we have the answer, we'll rewrite that as a, a mixed numeral, 3 and 6 25ths and look for that among the answer choices, and that's answer choice E. In summary, it's important to be comfortable changing back and forth between mixed numerals and improper fractions. It's important to be fluent in that conversion. If you need to determine the position of a fraction on the number line, mixed numerals may be a little more helpful. For calculations involving multiplication, division, or powers, mixed numerals are worse than useless you have to use improper fractions. And if the problem gives you mixed numerals in the prompt and gives you mixed numerals in the answer choice, what you need to do is change to improper fractions, do your calculation, and then change back. In this video, we're going to talk about the mathematics of proportions. A proportion is an equation of the form fraction equals fraction. In the ratio videos in the next module, you will learn about the many uses of proportion in problem solving. They're actually a very powerful problem solving tool. In this video, we will simply discuss the rules, what we can do and what we can't do with proportions. You have to understand the basic mathematical rules of what you can do with a proportion before you can even begin to use it in problem solving. One big idea is cross multiplication. When we have a proportion, we can immediately eliminate all fractions simply by cross multiplying. So if we have the proportion a over b equals c over d, that's a proportion, we can simply cross multiply. And of course what we've done is we've multiplied diagonally. We multiplied the a and the d, we multiplied the b and the c, and we have just set those two equal to each other. That's cross multiplying. So for example, this is a very powerful problem solving tool. If I want to solve for x, I just cross multiply. And then I get an ordinary algebra equation. I could just divide by 5 and find the value of x. For proportions with larger numbers, of course, we should cancel before we cross multiply. But be careful. What we can cancel in a proportion and what we can't cancel in a proportion is one of the most frequent problem areas of mathematics. So we're going to be very clear about this. What exactly are we allowed to cancel in the proportion a over b equals c over d? First of all, let's talk about legal con cancellation. Obviously, we can cancel factors in the numerator and denominator of the same fraction. We can always do that. So, for example, if there's a common factor in a and b, we can cancel that. If there's a common factor in c and d, we can cancel that. So I'm going to call this vertical cancellation, cancellation up and down in the same fraction. We can cancel factors in the two numerators on the opposite sides. So for example, if A and C have a common factor, we can cancel across that way. Essentially what we're doing is dividing both sides of the equation by the same number. That's always perfectly legal. Another type of horizontal cancellation, we can cancel factors 
on the two denominators on opposite sides. So B and D have a common factor. We can cancel there. So there, there's vertical cancellation on each side and then two types of horizontal cancellation and all of these are legal. So we can summarize. In a proportion, we can cancel vertically, numerator and denominator of the same fraction, or we can cancel horizontally, both numerators or both denominators on opposite sides. So all that is what is legal to do. Let's talk about what's illegal now. This is a very tricky topic because there is a move that is 100% illegal and wrong, and yet it's an extremely tempting mistake that some students are convinced is legal. In a proportion, diagonal cancellation is 100% incorrect and illegal. So for example, if we have A over B equals C over D, we absolutely cannot cancel a common factor in A and D. And we absolutely cannot cancel a common factor in B and C. That is 100% illegal. And in fact, if you think about it, cross multiplying says you're allowed to multiply those two things. Well, if you're allowed to multiply any two things, you're not allowed to divide them. Dividing two things always gives you a different answer than multiplying them. Here's where I think the confusion arises. When we multiply two fractions, cross cancellation is perfectly legal. So for example, here I have A over B times C over D. This is not a proportion. This is a product of two fractions. And in this, of course, we can cancel a common factor in A and D. Cross cancellation is perfectly fine. But in a proportion, this is completely illegal and incorrect. If I have A over B equals C over D, so this is a proportion now, if I cross cancel, that is illegal. I think what happens is people get very mechanical about the idea of cross cancellation and they neglect the difference. Is there a multiplication sign between the fractions? Is there an equal sign between the fractions? They neglect that detail and they carry over something that is legal in the multiplication case even though it's illegal in the proportion case. So it's very important to pay attention to this because it's a very easy trap in which to fall. Now that we have all that straight, we are in a position to simplify proportions involving larger numbers. So suppose we have this proportion. There are some large numbers in this. The first thing I'm going to do, I'll notice that in those two numerators, there's a factor of 11. So I can cancel the common factor there, and that become, goes down from 44 and 33 to just 4 and 3. Now notice also there's a common factor of 5 in the denominator. So I'll just divide the, the two denominators, divide them both by 5, and I get down to this. Now, at this point, there are some people who are going to look at those two 4s and say, wow, it really looks like we could cancel there. We could cross-cancel them. And that is 100% illegal. We cannot cancel those two 4s. In fact, at this point, the only thing we can do is cross-multiply. We cross-multiply and divide by x to find the answer. Here are some proportions to practice on your own. I recommend pausing the video now and practicing these. Here are the solutions. So in this video, we talked about the math with proportions. We learned about cross multiplication, and we talked about the importance of canceling before you multiply. And then we spent a lot of time talking about what you can cancel in a proportion, vertical and horizontal cancellation, and what you can't cancel, that is to say, diagonal cancellation. In this video, we're going to talk about word problems with fractions. The very first rule that we'll talk about is, as a general rule, when translating words to math, the word is means equals and the word of means multiply. This is a very important guide and this will help us translate many word problems involving fractions into math that we can do. For example, very simple question. This is a little simpler than you'd see on the test. What is three-fifths of 400? So this might actually be something that would be part of a larger problem on the test, but we'll just treat it as its own thing right now. Three-fifths of 400, the of means multiply. So this just means 3 fifths times 400. We write 400 as a fraction. We notice that we can cancel. 
Once we've canceled, then we can multiply and we get the answer. Another question. This is starting to get a little more test-like. Bill's monthly cable bill is two-sevenths of his monthly rent. If he pays $300 on cable each month, what is his monthly rent? So this is interesting. The first thing I'll do is I'll introduce some letters to stand for these things. C equals cable, R equals rent. Now that first sentence, cable is two-sevenths of rent. That means cable equals two-sevenths times R. Now once I have this equation, I'll just substitute the value I have. The cable is actually $300. Now we want to get the R by itself, so I have to multiply by the reciprocal of that fraction. The reciprocal of two sevenths would be seven halves. So I multiply both sides by seven halves, I cancel, and then I just complete the multiplication. For this one, now this one is starting to get to be like something that actually might be on the test. Kathy's salary is three-sevenths of Nora's salary and is five-fourths of Teresa's salary. Nora's salary is what fraction of Teresa's salary? So this is a very confusing question. So first thing I'm going to say is we'll represent each one of the salaries by the first letter of the female's name. So C is three-sevenths of N also, C is 5 fourths of T. So we can translate that first sentence like this. Now notice that the question is asking us to relate Nora and Teresa's salary. So really, C is irrelevant. Really, that part of the equation drops out. and We just want to compare Teresa and Nora. And we want Nora's salary is what fraction of? So we want Nora by herself and we want a fraction times Teresa. So to get Nora by herself, we have to multiply by the reciprocal of 3 sevenths. That would be multiplying by 7 thirds. That would get n by itself. We just multiply and we get the fraction of 35 over 12. In most word problems, of means multiply and is means equals.